I think we have skipped two generations in terms of this kind of deep understanding of the political economy and how it affects natural resources. Because we've got two generations that have been so in love with technology that they literally think that if there's a problem, we can fix it with technology, rather than technology being so overwhelming that it becomes unfixable. And ASR is an example of that. We think well, we can just, we, you know, we got a water shortage. Oh, well, here's something magic. We'll just throw ASR at it. Or we're going to throw desal at it. <laughs> and what part of what you're facing is the fact that a fragment world we divide things into its parts. You know, and water is one place that kind of reach people recognize, but it's only one portion of it. It's the whole, it's all of it. It's all over together, and we break things in its parts so much as we don't. You know, if everybody understood, if you just took the example you were using with one smartphone and what all the cost that goes into that, the amount of, I, I, I read one time, how many pounds of natural resources is distilled out to make one laptop, and what goes with the rest of that waste. You know, and what has, has to be mined in order to make that one. And what do we do with the rest of this? And there's those, those costs are not built in. Well, the political problem that we face that you and Gordon are probably talking about is it's in the interest of a very small but very influential number of people that people don't understand all of this. Well, they said everybody's interest, but we're not having to face it till somewhere down the road. Oh yeah, it's, it's another generation. So we, we've got to really be talking to young folks say it's, it's where we're balancing our books on your back. And what we're also seeing is that that very small crowd of people that benefit from that externalized cost and benefit from everybody not understanding that along the along, they also wind up proposing to benefit from the solution to fix all the problems that they just created. And that's exactly what we're seeing with Senate Bill 213. It's a handful of people that would benefit from that. And they created the problem. The lobbying firm that is pushing the thing forward is Joe Tanner and Associates. So it's Joe Tanner, Harold Rehais, David Word, and Alan Barnes. Former DNR commissioner, two former EPD directors, and a former assistant EPD director. Well, they presided over all the permitting and all over permitting the over permitting that led to the problem. And now they're trying to profit from the problem. And it's disgusting, but it's but it's a it's an allegory of how the whole thing works worldwide. I'm glad you mentioned Cadillac Desert for several reasons. It it is a very well told story about how power and money gets concentrated into very few hands in the form of water. It is a story of mining water. It is a story that involves an example from Georgia. There's actually a whole chapter on the Flint River in Cadillac Desert and, and how that has influenced. Into. Yeah, just that collision of these it's, concepts. Is Jimmy Carter's defeat was a lot to do with water? Yeah, people and don't understand did. that it wasn't about uh, the hostages that he had no friends in either party, including his own party, by the time he got to that crisis, because he had made everybody in every district in America mad over not getting new reservoirs. And so when he needed help, there wasn't. And that's one lens of But he was looking at him. Very, he was looking 250 years down the road. And he was looking at corruption and trying to fix it. So think what you will of Jimmy Carter, but in terms of water, he was spot on. Now, the author of Cadillac Desert was not very kind to Mr. Carter. And he said that his motivations and intentions were less than pure. But whatever his motivations and intentions were, it was evident to anybody that looked. Another reason that Cadillac Desert is important, and this is really worth mentioning, is that from a, from a geopolitical and economic standpoint, it points out 
where this magical greening of the desert in California and in the closer western states, and particularly in the high plains in, in western Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas, that water's going to run out. And it's on a clock that's way less than 50 years. We're looking at about 30 years now. Now, they've extended it with efficiency, but it's going to run out. What that means for a place like the Darty Plain, where it doesn't have to run out, it depends on how we manage it. It's going to run out in the Ogallala Aquifer, and it's going to run out in the Central California Valley. It's going to make South Georgia and the Darty Plain that much more important in terms of food and fiber production. And it's, it's unavoidable. It's, this is going to happen. The Central California Valley, most people don't realize this, produces about half of the agricultural economic value in the entire country in that one place. And when that's gone, that changes everything. And then that's followed by the high plains. And that changes everything uh, in terms of the value of this water and the importance of what we need to be doing. Even if you don't care about whether water flows in the creek or not and some muscle being alive or being able to fish or have a baptism of power. Even if you don't care about that, which I do, which you ought to care about the money and about and about where we're going with our agriculture. So I highly recommend reading the yeah, Cadillac Desert. Would did he also cover the east and west fork of the Mississippi and the New Orleans and the too? Can you that's such a strong illustration that how they continue to force it down to the New Orleans and float it off. So they can float the oil tankers to Baton Rouge. Right, I understand. That, <laughs> Go over that illustration to me where it means. Tell the story. You're telling the story. Go ahead. Well, if you look at the Mississippi River where it flows down to New Orleans, that's the East Fork. Over, over geological time, historically, you'd have, it would follow that path, and then the silt builds up and it would back up. It would flop back over to the to west. The to the Achatala and come out over that area around St. Charles or something. Right. And then it would fill up and back and forth. But the, so as to keep the oil system and all the economy from New Orleans north, they continue to build dams and force it to stay on the east fork. Well, that's what all this problem with New Orleans is. That in ecology time, it cannot withstand it because they have to build the dam higher and higher. And New Orleans yeah. is getting lower, you know, <laughs> below the level. And so that weight is kind of in time is against them. And it's going the, to fail. The recent issues with yeah. Americans is just a little tip of that. It cannot sustain. But every, all that economy is built on and they're fighting against nature. And we're shoving that problem off into the future. Right. And Katrina was just a taste. Right, just kicking the can down.